So good morning, everybody. My name is Jim Logan. I'm from No Magic, and uh, we're a tool vendor. We build uh, architecture tools. Uh, you might have heard of some of these uh, specifications like uh, UML and SysML and UPDM and VPMN and whatever. Uh, our tool does all of that, and uh, uh, now we have some capabilities for the FIBO team and for the semantic web in general. And so I'm the, uh, the principal architect and the product manager. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about um, how to bridge the gap between the semantic web eco ecosystem and the OMG ecosystem of architecture. Um, there's, uh, there's, uh, I want to talk about if inefficiencies in, uh, in, in organizations and uh, how FIBO comes to the rescue, um, some practical ways to, uh, to bridge the gap between these two ecosystems that don't normally talk very well. Um, and then I have an example where I'm going to drive down from FIBO down to a typical information model just to kind of give people the gist of how things work and how things map. And then uh, I'm going to wrap up and, and uh, kind of reiterate my recommendations for, uh, for how to go forward and how to, uh, how to map uh, between these two ecosystems. And then I'll have a slide on the, uh, the tools that I used. So um, I think that a lot of organizations are kind of resigned. They shrug their shoulders and they say, well, you know, this is just the way things have to be. Uh, we have to have a certain amount of uh, miscommunication. We have to have uh, ambiguous business processes. Uh, we have to tolerate some amount of uh, misinterpreted system requirements and some, uh, uh, you know, build th build systems that are not quite the right uh, system. <clears throat> we have to have we have to put up with some misaligned uh, schemas. Um, I don't think that's really true. I think that we can do better than that. <clears throat> and uh, part of the trouble with systems is that uh, business people know business, IT people know IT, IT people don't really want to know much about the business and business people don't want to know much about IT. And so um, we typically build architectures and models with a particular system in mind. And we have this perennial miscommunication between IT and, and, uh, and the business people. And we've tried some things in the past. We tried uh, doing analysis, we've tried doing uh, glossaries and business processes and functional requirements and information models and user stories, you know, agile. And um, uh, architecture and design kind of went out of fashion for a while, uh, while we kind of swung the pendulum towards agile. And I think the pendulum is kind of swinging back now because we realize that you can't really build a battleship in an agile way, uh, at least not with the original uh, user story kind of approach. <clears throat> and so uh, typically architecture is done with a system in mind. And there's, there's actually problems with with uh, having that approach, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And so, um, what do I mean by architecture? Um, ISO and ANSI, they have uh, standardized definitions of uh, what an architecture is. And in general, it's just, what are the big chunks? How do they interoperate? What are they responsible for? And those big chunks can be uh, people interacting with hardware, running software, um, exchanging information with other systems. <clears throat> and so, an and, and architecture is about how does this stuff work? What is the concept of operations and, and so forth? So it can include business uh, architectures. It can include information architectures, um, hardware architectures. And still, it's all constructed with a particular system in mind. And so what are some examples of, of uh, architectural models? Um, here we've got architect uh, architectures of uh, people, processes, capabilities, nodes, systems, information. You name it. And it could be that you know, the enterprise data world um, that you all will be more familiar with the information centric things, uh, conceptual data models, logical data models, physical data models, and maybe even process models. Um, but there's a lot more to architecture. <laughs> so some of the, uh, the consequences, the technical consequences, are that you, you, uh, your, your business processes get ignored, your databases uh, have shortcuts, they don't align with the business, they're too expensive to refactor. Uh, the business person says, you know, hey, I want this new feature. You say, it's going to take you, you know, at least six months to make that change. Why? Um, and probably because it's misaligned with the business. Um, <clears throat> system architectures have uh, misunderstood requirements. They have um, integration misunderstandings where uh, the, the things that are put into the information exchange uh, were misinterpreted and the things that get pulled out of the information exchange are misinterpreted. Um, and then mis uh, mismatches uh, for services between uh, the sender who wants to, uh, to get some, so some sort of a service and the service provider who provides the service 
um, they're not on the same page. They're not well documented and, and so forth. And so you get a misinterpretation of exchange information again. And so <clears throat> there's some pretty dire uh, financial consequences of misalignment. And um, you know, Gartner talks about you know 25% runaway b budget and 50% uh, higher failure rate for projects that are greater than one million. Um, one in six have an average cost overrun of 200% and a schedule overrun, an overrun of 70%. Why? Why are these so bad? Uh, we're losing 100, up to 150 billion per year in the U.S. So, is this due to miscommunication and misalignment? I think it has a lot to do with it. <clears throat> so, what if we could create a durable model of the business without a system in mind? What if, what if we could kind of ignore a particular system and model how the domain works? Not just the business processes in BPMN, but what do the things mean? Well, we actually have that. Um, FIBO has done this for us and is doing that for us. So they're bridging the gap between business and technology by precisely defining what these, uh, these concepts are. And it's a model of meaning. It's not a design model for a particular database. It's not a, it's not a model for a particular system. It's a model for uh, any number of systems. And it, it allows us to, um, to, to semantically integrate systems if they all pin their definitions of, say, columns and tables to the same concepts in FIBO. If you have a couple of systems that do that, then you know that this column means the same as that column. And you know that you can interoperate and that you can send information between the two systems. So what is it that makes FIBO so different and so useful? Well, um, it defines things using criteria and logical axioms, which is kind of a technical gobbledygook way of saying, <laughs> basically, it's, it's criteria that you can, uh, that when you're examining something, you can apply and say, does it meet these checkboxes? Yes, OK, I know that this, this, this sort of a thing. And the light bulb, light bulb goes off, and you know what it is. And it works in reverse, too. If you, if you look at something in FIBO um, and you look at the criteria, you can figure out uh, what in your data uh, or what in your architecture uh, meets those criteria and is that sort of a thing. So um, you know, just some, some examples are, uh, you know, if you, if you say that, uh, that something that gives live birth and produces milk implies that something's a mammal, then when you examine something and it, if it produces milk, you can say, ah, it's a mammal because my criteria tells me so. So we can use this to define architectural elements. Um, all the different kinds of architecture I talked about, not just information architecture. Um, and we can, we can also define data elements for semantic interoperability. And we can also constrain the possible interpretations of a model. Um, usually an information model is very uh, open to interpretation. And I've actually worked on projects where uh, there were six different groups of people all putting data into the same tables in different ways and pulling it out in different ways. And there was no interoperability, even, even on a team that was sitting next to each other for months. So it helps to identify false interoperability and constrain the, uh, the possible interpretations. <clears throat> so uh, how is an ontology different from a data model? A, um, an ontology is about uh, unambiguous meaning. What is the criteria? What, is the, uh, and, and what are the terms? And, and, and these things are vetted with business people, with experts. Um, they, they say what's true about a domain, what exists in a domain, and they're all about clarity. Whereas a data model is about how to organize and structure data. How do you put things into fifth normal form? Um, what data are you going to record? So, you know, just as an example, um, an ontology might tell, tell us that a person's eye has measurable visual acuity. That's something that's measurable. It doesn't tell you that you must measure it. And it doesn't tell you how often you're going to measure it or how you're going to structure the measurements or how you're going to encode the bits. That's what a data model is about. So another example is that a personnel record doesn't go to jail when somebody breaks the law. A person does. So an ontology, the, per, the, the, the subject of an ontology is things in the real world. When we talk about a person, we're talking about these people. Um, we're not talking about data records. <clears throat> and so people in IT have been conflating these things for a long time. And that sort of works. But it can lead to miscommunication and, and, uh, and confusion. So the, uh, the bottom here is, um, is a famous painting called the, Tre the Treachery of Images. And uh, it says in French, this is not a pipe. Well, it's true. It's not a pipe. It's a picture of a pipe. And so we conflate the picture of the pipe with the real pipe. And this, cause, this, is, this, this can cause all kinds of confusion. So 
Um, FIBO exists in the semantic web ecosystem. Architecture exists in the OMG or ecosystem largely. And these things, um, they, they haven't done so well in terms of, uh, of interoperating. So um, the OMG, by the way, the OMG ecosystem is responsible for things like uh, the business process modeling notation, uh, the unified profile for DODAF and MODAF for DOD, um, SysML, the, uh, the, the, the system modeling notation that's used for uh, JPL to model rockets, for example, and uh, the unified modeling language. <coughs> and so how do we bridge this gap between the semantic web ecosystem and the OMG ecosystem of, of architecture? So there's a couple of bridges, and um, there are still others that are sort of uh, uh, forming. Um, so, by the way, uh, the OMG ecosystem is also based on uh, MOF, the Ma Managed Object Facility and, uh, and the Unified Modeling Language. And um, uh, so when I talk about uh, UML profiles here, I'm talking about uh, ways of extending the Unified Modeling Language to be able to, uh, to model um, uh, a domain in the real world. So there's a couple of bridges here. One is uh, the UML profile for the, for the ontology definition meta model. That's called ODM. And the bridge number two is the UML profile for semantic information modeling for federation. So on to, uh, ODM has been around for a while, since 2008. And it's a faithful graphical representation of AL2. And it's used to produce parts of FIBO. So here's an example in the lower right. And here's an example bigger of what that would look like. So this represents all of the, uh, the axioms in AL very faithfully. Um, bridge number two is the semantic information modeling for federation. This is in the standardization process at the OMG. Um, it, it provides semantic interoperability, and it provides more of a molecular approach rather than an atomic approach to semantics. So there are things that you can say, which is boxes and lines, that mean a lot of things in OWL. So you don't have to say all those things in OWL. Uh, the Cameo Concept Modeler, that's the, my product at, at Nomagic, um, it's a growing subset of SEMP. So um, we are actively contributing to SIMF, and we are uh, the reference implementation right now. And so here's an example of what that would look like. Um, and this notation is something that's been um, successfully used with subject matter experts for a number of years. Um, I started using this particular kind of notation around circa 2005 with the General Services Administration. And we would put this notation up on a wall and we would visually take notes while the subject matter experts were telling us about their domain. And we'd walk away with, uh, with notes that we could do something with and that we could uh, you know, assimilate into a larger model. And then we could generate uh, natural language glossaries that would read the models and read the models in plain text uh, out to the, uh, the subject matter experts. And they could go through and say, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's right. Um, and they can do that without even looking at the, uh, the human typed in definitions if you have the criteria um, specified well enough. And so the, the, uh, the subject matter experts would actually see their notation, see their domain on the wall and say, that's not right. That thing is not a kind of a that thing. And that thing doesn't have that many things. Um, they would correct us and we get this immediate feedback. So this, um, this notation is actually field proven. So here's a side-by-side -side example just so that you can get, an get a uh, feel for uh, for the two notations. The, uh, the, the one on the left is ODM, the one on the right is SIMF. And um, there's a, a re relatively simple example. The one on the left is actually lifted straight from the, uh, the, the FIBO Foundation specification from the OMG. I've literally just copied and pasted out of the specification for this. And, uh, and then I reworked it in uh, CCM. And those are identical uh, semantics. Here's side by side a more complex example of a person having a variety of different kinds of names and uh, how uh, some of these names are equivalent to other kinds of names and uh, how some are, uh, are sub-properties of, of names and so forth. And then here's an, automated, um, an automatically generated glossary. And uh, this is just one example of how uh, we can read out in plain natural language uh, to a subject matter expert and go through with a red pen and say, no, this is wrong. And so we've got a, a, a something called the Cameo Collaborator uh, that allows us to publish this to a website and the user can go in and they can actually draw red X's and mark things up and uh, type in the correct definitions and, uh, and that, that goes back into the model through a person. So 
the, uh, the Cameo Concept Modeler, um, it imports FIBO. It makes FIBO easier to, lear easier to learn because you can drag and drop onto a, onto a diagram and it automatically lay lays out a, a diagram for you. Um, it helps you to kind of swim through the, um, the, the, the concepts and the, uh, the, the properties. And um, it's proven to be understandable to business users. So um, if you customize your, uh, if you customize FIBO for your own purposes, which you should do if you're using it in your enterprise, um, you want to have these nice tidy diagrams that you can um, you know, confidently show to business users and know that they're going to understand them. Um, and it generates uh, natural language glossaries. And it, it, it's, it's familiar to architects because it's just plain UML. So, uh, and I shouldn't say it's plain UML, it's, it's kind of a, uh, an interpretation of UML. Uh, when you put the profile on the package and you say that this is a concept model, it changes the interpretation. Um, and what that allows you to do is it allows you to, 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 um, to align with a variety of, of models. Um, analysis, architecture, OO models, uh, information models. And it allows you to define things in those architectural models uh, in one model of meaning. And um, so here I'm showing um, CCM uh, generating AL, importing from AL. And you can see that there's a lot of overlap um, between CCM and the UML. There's only a little sliver of, of additional expressivity that we've had to add. Um, the rest is all just um, an interpretation of UML. So now on to the next part, which is the, uh, the practical solutions for, uh, for how, to, uh, how to avoid all this wastage and uh, how, to, how to bridge the, uh, the gaps. So uh, the most fundamental thing is align with the model of meaning, like FIBO. Um, you know, align your processes, your requirements, your services, your databases, your software. Um, align all of these concepts. Um, customize FIBO for your, uh, for your own organization. Uh, make it something that is, uh, is you know, specific to your line of business, for example. Um, <clears throat> generate a natural language glossary. Um, have the subject matter experts validate the model. Um, make sure that they're on board with what you're modeling and that, it, that the, uh, the terminology feels right to them and, and that sort of thing. Uh, although you, you may not always get 100% um, um, uh, agreement across uh, all the lines of business and so forth. Um, that's part of why uh, FIBO and the semantic web is better is because you have logical definitions for things and you can largely put aside the terminology. Um, and then use uh, tools that bridge these ecosystems. Use ODM, use CCM, whatever you like, um, but bring the semantic web into the, um, uh, the, the architectural uh, uh, OMG um, uh, ecosystem. And um, Align all of your uh, your definitions. Align your models. Transition. Fi okay, then you want to take uh, FIBO and transition it to um, analysis and information models. You can do this easily in CCM because they look just like normal UML models. Um, they look they can look like analysis models, information models, whatever you like, and um, and then generate software and schemas from one information model. You can generate from one model by convention. You can generate DDL. You can generate XML schema. Uh, you can generate, generate JSON LD. Um, you can generate AL, whatever you like. Um, and then uh, map, map your existing information models from the bottom up. Um, you know, read in your, your uh, relational schemas and your XML schemas and your national information exchange models um, and map them to FIBO. Uh, that'll help you to get some semantic interoperability. You can start uh, easy and, and uh, just do the classes or you can make it uh, more, uh, uh, more com complete and, uh, and do property chains through FIBO and say that this property chain is equivalent to this, uh, this, this column in a table. So here's an example of, um, of FIBO foundations in the pink on the top. And um, what I've done is I've, I've specialized this for some fictitious uh, purpose so that I can have uh, an organization, basically a company that acts in a role as an employer employing people who act in the role of employee. It's a pretty simple example, and um, this is actually probably going to be largely unreadable. <laughs> Basically, there are things that play play roles. A um, uh, an employer plays the role uh, is is the role played by a uh, an organization, um, and the role that it plays is is a uh, is an employer. I think I said that right. There's actually a, a, a problem that we're resolving in FIBO about uh, uh, roles and things in roles. Um, but the gist is that um, we've got uh, several things that have been kind of uh, broken apart or atomized, if you will. Uh, they're going to get conflated for an information model. And here for an employee, 
um, you can see employed person and um, employee and person down there at the bottom and uh, uh, in position. And so those turn into uh, an information model that looks kind of like this, where you've got a company, an employee, you've got a position, um, and this thing can generate DDL, XML schema, and whatnot. And so the way that you do that is you cherry pick from, uh, from FIBO. You say that, uh, for example, that you want uh, has given name and has surname, and those are the things that, that exist. Let's see, can I point? So we have a surname and given name, and those, are the, those would map to, uh, to FIBO. And so you also want to collapse FIBO. A lot of times uh, you either uh, don't want or don't, no, don't need all these, uh, these atomized details, and you can kind of uh, uh, combine things and conflate things. And a lot of times people go too far in this, and they conflate too much. Um, so these, these three things, person, employed person, and employee, get conflated into employee. Uh, which is just one, uh, which would turn into one table with an ID, a surname, and a given name, for example. And then we get into the, um, uh, the, the class traceability. This is for the simple example of how to do um, some semantic interoperability mapping. Um, so down here on the bottom, actually I have a little LED thing. There we go. So here we've got uh, the example information model. We've got company, employee, and position. And here we've got FIBO. We've got company, employed person, employee, employer, employing company, and position. And we're showing in this traceability matrix, uh, just by double clicking here, you can say that company uh, maps to or realizes uh, company. And employee realizes a couple of things in, uh, that, that maybe are being conflated. Um, one is employed person, uh, one is employee, um, position maps to position. So that's a, a simple way to start uh, mapping your mapping your model of meaning to your architecture. And by the way, this works for all kinds of architectural models, not just for information models. You can do this for uh, for your BPMN processes, and you can do this for your uh, your systems and your uh, your services and everything else. Oh, another thing to point out, just to, to to reduce any confusion, these numbers here are basically summarizing how many things are in this column. And this is how many things are in this row. So one, two, three mappings. And the reason I point that out is because it gets, it gets more complicated on this next screen here. This is actually um, uh, different levels of, of nesting and different levels of nesting of numbers and so forth. But the gist here is that um, under company, there are some properties, ID and name, for example, an employee, um, ID and surname. Uh, by the way, these this employee and this uh, uh, Oh, yeah, this, this employee here um, is actually, would, would, be would, would get rep uh, replaced uh, in a relational database with uh, an intersect entity or uh, uh, other things. This is basically a foreign key, primary key thing. Um, but the gist here is that uh, ID and name uh, and, and ID and surname uh, have a mapping to something in FIBO. So surname maps to has surname. And so... Last slide is uh, the tools that I used here, the Chemio Concept Modeler and uh, Magic Draw for, the, uh, for all the diagrams. So that's it. Thank you. Okay, we have time for questions. As I said, this is Cameo. This is the tooling that right now only no Magic has, but that's not the goal. The goal is that this is based upon a standard, so all of you can, who are tool vendors can actually do exactly the same thing. That's what I'm expecting. Questions for Jim? So I have a question. Okay. So really good. Uh, I think of sim and it's uh, some simplicity. You've taken a very complex mapping and you've made it readable, which, which is very good. A uh, question that I have is, uh, are you, do you have on your roadmap uh, R2 RML mapping? So if I have, for example, a, a need to map between my ontology, FIBO, and my physical uh, instances through DDL, because I want to do a virtual federated query using my ontology to my legacy data, are you able to generate the R2 RML for those mappings? That is a goal, yes. We want to be able to, uh, to generate, if, if you say that, that... 
Okay, let me, let me, yeah, sorry about that. So just uh, to be quick, uh, I've asked Jim if he is able to generate R2 RML mappings so that I can map between my ontology FIBO and my relational tables, for example. Right, thanks. So the answer is yes, that is one of the goals of SIMF is to be able to generate that, uh, that R2 RMF. Uh, and so, uh, RML, sorry. And, um, in, in, and uh, not be limited to just that. Uh, we want to be able to, uh, to generate uh, code, if, if need be, uh, that will transform, for example, uh, a relational database into the National Exchange, Information Exchange model uh, and, and then back from the information exchange model to another relational database. Um, so it, it sort of transcends um, all of that and is more technology neutral. Uh, but the idea is that you would be able to generate um, all of these things uh, from a SIMF model um, when, when, you, when you map the, uh, the, the information model to the, uh, to the concept model. Any other questions? So, so there are some people who say that we need an alpha male in order to get Good meaning. Just a single person. I learned in this question, you need a bunch of swings. Does your tool help facilitate the, the those two different spectrums? In other words, is there a quality reference for meaning? A quality reference for meaning? Right. Same way I've got it. And that's the meaning track. Oh, well, okay. So the, the, uh, I think the question, let me restate it. I think that you're saying that there are two schools of thought. One is that you need uh, uh, an alpha male who says this is the way things are. And, and uh, subject matter experts who, uh, as a as a as a team, tell you the way things are. Yeah, too, many of them. too many of them, sure. Um, and I and I think that the answer is that you need a a combination of, of both. Um, you need somebody who uh, understands what the subject matter experts are saying and uh, uses it to inform the model. And then that you 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 create this model and you can use things like natural language glossaries to get their agreement. And you can use things like these uh, these simplified diagrams to get their agreement. And um, in my experience, it's all about um, the way that you present this to the, uh, to the group to get the heads to nod. And so if you can, rather than uh, present a big horse blanket, uh, you know, like an ER diagram you might have seen that takes up a wall, if you can have these little focused diagrams and say, do we get agreement on this little bit right here? Yeah, okay, let's move on. Next. And you, you move through this thing and you get everybody, and I've got, I, the General Services Administration was like this. Um, we had, um, uh, different offices all across the U.S. that didn't agree with one another. They, but they did business differently, and they used the same terms to mean different things. We got agreement um, across the whole U.S. So um, I think it's a combination of, you know, having an alpha male, somebody who's, who's strong enough to understand uh, what the, what's being said and is strong enough to, uh, to kind of yank out the abstractions and simplify the model and then bring it back to them and say, are these things correct? Right. Versus saying you want to take a more uh, what you want to call scientific approach or a, a formal uh, approach. More formal approach. So your recommendation would be is that having these tools at hand, presumably if we're going to start doing glossaries, you would recommend going through this approach versus this I would. approach or say, you know, raise your hand, what do you think the definition of this right? Well you can start with yeah, okay. So I, I think what the what the question is is about governance and uh, you know would I recommend um, uh, using a, a glossary kind of an, appro of an approach, or would I recommend uh, more of a, uh, a formal approach? And um, I, I think that you start with an informal approach, getting the definitions and, and, and whatnot, and you can, like I say, you know, up on the wall, you can actually make a, a scratch model of what they're talking about, and then um, incorporate this and abstract this into a simpler model, um, and then give this back to them uh, in, a, in a natural language. And they should see that natural language reflected back at them. Okay, thank you very much, Jim.